So if we, once we're ready to go with the live stream, uh, let's kick it off. You're all set to go. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Um, we're really excited today because this is the first time we've had um, three speakers um, for the seminar. Uh, and I'll just quickly go through the house rules and um, tell you a little bit about next week before I hand over to um, Marco Torres, who's chairing the lecture today. So um, this is the Unicorn Seminars, and um, we're in the first themed block of this year, um, where the theme is Optomechanical Interfaces uh, of Quantum Mechanics and Gravity. And in today's um, seminar, uh, please keep your video and your microphone off. Uh, please be kind and respectful. And um, we ask that you, because we have three talks, we will take one or two brief questions after each talk. Um, but then we'll keep, um, after all three talks, you can return with more of your questions. And we ask that you either raise your hand in Zoom or you write your question in the chats. And if you're watching on YouTube, please write your question in the YouTube chat, which we are monitoring, and we'll pass it on to the speaker. So next week, we're really excited to have the final talk for this block, which will be a panel discussion with Angela Bassi, Miles Blanco, um, Kassler Bruckner, Yvette Fuentes, Andrew Giracci, and Gary Steele. Um, and this is going to be really exciting, and we'll make that a bit longer, so one and a half hours. And we'll discuss some of these questions that we raise here um, in this in this block um, on the intersection of quantum mechanics and gravity. Um, so we're really excited for that. Um, but without further ado, um, let me introduce um, the chat for today, who is Marco Torres, who's a postdoctoral researcher based in Glasgow. Um, and Marco does lots of work on theoretical optomechanics mechanics and on testing fundamental physics with optomechanics. mechanics. So over to you, Marco, and thank you so much for sharing today's talk. Well, th thank you very much for um, inviting me to chair this session. Uh, I want first to, to thank all the organizers for a lot of uh, invisible work behind the scenes to make this seminar series work. So uh, it's been a great success, success last year and this year is also going pretty well. Um, so today's uh, seminar series is a continuation of uh, the, the first block, which is about the interface between quantum mechanics and gravity. This is a very interesting, probably one of the most fascinating topics of, um, let's say, um, modern physics. It's an open question, um, but it's an open question that has finally, uh, there is finally some hope to see some experimental uh, tests about concrete ideas. Uh, this is also one of the, the uh, let's say, the common points among all three speakers. So they both all three speakers are theoreticians, but they work relatively close to experiments. And today they will talk about concrete experiments and proposal for experiments. Um, so without uh, further ado, let me go to the first speaker. So the first speaker is uh, currently a PhD student uh, at University College London. So Ryan Marshall, uh, he's, uh, a PhD student uh, under the supervision of Professor Sugato Bos. He's done uh, uh, already a series of interesting works. Uh, today, he will talk about the so-called QGEM protocol, so quantum gravity tangling of masses. Uh, so with that, without further ado, uh, I now ask uh, Ryan to share the screen. Uh, hello, can everyone see this? Yes, it's looking good. Cool. Uh, hello, uh, firstly, let me say thank you very much for um, uh, letting me give a talk today. Uh, so yes, as I said, my name's Ryan. I've been working with uh, Shigeru Bose and also fairly closely with Anupam Zamda. And um, yeah, I'll be giving a talk on large mass interferometry for the purpose of witnessing quantum, the quantum nature of linearized gravity. Um, okay, so just as a brief outline oh, sorry, of the talk, I'll begin by just presenting our definitions of classical and quantum. So what we mean when we saw, say we're capable of witnessing whether uh, gravity is fundamentally classical or quantum uh, before going into detail about the actual proposal itself. 
then into some of the underlying assumptions and requirements for the experiment specifically so that we could potentially conclude whether you know gravity is actually quantum uh, and finally try and give some sort of intuition behind what this actually tells us about quantum gravity uh, so to begin with uh, we can start with uh, the basics of well, what do we mean when we say a, a classical field so it's simply something that takes a unique value at every point in space so that's just a you know fairly standard textbook definition um, some people would say, well, if you, in the context of gravity, we might say that the uh, Newtonian potential energy is a signature of uh, gravity being classical. Um, and that's something I would uh, uh, strongly suggest, you know, let's, let's not think about it that way. Specifically, while, you know, Newtonian's uh, theory of gravity was obviously uh, iconic uh, classical theory, the, if you have a gravitational theory that uh, reproduces the Newtonian potential energy, it just means you're doing it right, really. Um, okay, so then what do we mean when we call, uh, when we I use the term quantum gravity? So, well, there's many signatures of quantum mechanics that we could be referring to, so such as, you know, Planck's constant, quantized energy levels, dynamics characterized by Schrodinger's equation, superpositions, wave particle duality, entanglement. Lots of these are uh, both signatures of what makes quantum sort of things quantum. But the the two sort of things that I would like to hone in on are specifically uh, superpositions and entanglement. So if we go back to our de definition of, of a classical field that I've given, um, superpositions is really the antithesis of this. So specifically uh, a field that takes a, a superposition of different values at any point in space is automatically non-classical and there's no way to interpret it in a classical way, well, at least as a, according to the standard textbook definition. Um, furthermore, entanglement is something that you just cannot generate in uh, without doing sort of non-classical things. And this is a, obviously, a, it's a cornerstone of the experiment that you can sort of witness this entanglement. Um, okay, so now, go on to the actual uh, experimental proposal itself. So the original uh, paper, the original experiment was proposed in this paper, which was work done by, uh, as you can see, a very large group of different people from all across the world. And so what they were looking at doing is they suggested you start with a, um, take a diamond nanosphere with an embedded nitrogen vacancy center. So this gives you a relatively large mass uh, on the order of 10 to the minus 15 kilograms. Uh, with a internal uh, controllable and addressable spin state. So that's the nitrogen vacancy center gives you that. So if you were to take such an object and send it through a stern gerlach apparatus, depending on the internal spin state, it'll move say left or right. So if you were to initialize, initialize the internal spin state in a uh, superposition of being spin up and spin down, say, it will be moving both left, it'll move in a superposition of moving left and right, allowing you to effectively turn this mass into a spatial qubit. So the experimental proposal suggests we take two of these, uh, send them both through a stern gerlach apparatus and putting them both in a superposition of uh, being left and right, giving uh, four joint position states. Uh, left, 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 right, right, left, and right, right. And then just sort of let them interact with one another, specifically put them next to another one, one another so they interact through gravity. This will take each um, state, make them in, uh, evolve as shown here. So they begin in uh, separable states before evolving to this state, which for most times T is explicitly actually an entangled state. And importantly, for experimental parameters, which are, shall we say, near future, so for distances on the order of hundreds of micrometers for both the superposition size, or superposition size would be less than that, but for the distances uh, are involved, as well as the uh, masses of on the order of 10 to the minus 15 kilograms and for times on the order of a second, uh, this should produce a appreciable amount of entanglement here. So, Furthermore, as the masses have just embedded spin states and the spin states are correlated with the position states with their position basis, uh, if we were to close the superpositions by bringing the mass states to overlap with one another, any entanglement can actually be read out just through simple spin measurements. 
And so this is effectively the experimental proposal. So how does this tell us that, uh, oh, so uh, first I'll uh, give a brief in, sort of uh, intuition behind why this experiment should be the, could be the way to probe quantum gravity. So if we uh, are initially just consider dropping one of the superposition states, you could say that this amounts to having a test mass, which is uh, witnessing the uh, gravitational potential as generated by a superposition state. And so what it should then see is a superposition of different uh, gravitational potentials. Of course, though, there's nothing wrong with interpreting, interpreting this in the opposite way around, whereby you've got a single potential as generated by A, and B simply probes this source uh, potential in uh, two different locations. As such, although there is an interpretation in which the gravitational potential is in a superposition, it's not required for this experiment to return identical results. If, however, we add, uh, make sure that Alice has her particle in a superposition, then there is no way to interpret it without sort of invoking a superposition of uh, gravitational potentials. Okay, so why does this tell us, why would seeing this entanglement uh, tell us that gravity is somehow quantum? So concretely, you could say at this stage that this witnessing entanglement at the end would tell us that gravity is capable of entangling the masses. Okay, so to take the next leap and say, therefore gravity is, is, is quantum, we need to uh, turn to quantum information theory, specifically that they uh, describe a class of uh, operations known as local operations and classical communications. And so this is when you have, uh, Alice has a particle or a system and Bob has a, part of, uh, has a system and they can do whatever they want to their own system. And while they're doing that, they have some sort of classical channel between them. This could be say, a, just a, you know, a phone line between them or something more fundamental, say a, a, a shared can tran transmit only classical information. And when you have this situation, it doesn't matter what they do, what Alice and Bob do, what game they play, whatever entanglement is between Alice and Bob at the beginning of the experiment cannot, cannot be increased upon. So that if Alice's system and Bob's system are uh, separable at the beginning of the exper experiment, there's no way for there to be entanglement between them at the end. So thus, if uh, the gravitational channel is sufficient for entanglement to form, then there's no way for it to be interpreted as a classical channel. And so it is in this sense, it's in this way that we say that if we could do this, if we do this experiment and we see entanglement, then we can conclude that gravity is uh, fundamental, fundamentally and in some deep level uh, quantum. Um, so this still relies on a few assumptions. So specifically, we require that the two systems to be at, in some sense, at a distance. They're non-local to one another. This ensures that the uh, particles A and B do not directly interact, interact with one another. So this just sets some sort of um, requirements on the wave functions overlap, but nothing specifically difficult to do. The second requirement is that there's no action and a distance going on. So for example, uh, if the gravitational field acts like acts as an action at a distance. This means that despite the fact that the two systems are physically separated from one another, the gravitational field would allow them to interact directly. And so the requirements for uh, the system to be either described as local, oper local operations in classical communications or quantum communications, it does not hold. Finally, uh, we need to be sure that the only way the two masses are interacting with one another is through gravity. So this is definitely the hardest assumption to, to make sure that it holds, but it's ultimately just a, well, I say just a, but it's a experimental constraint really. So what you would need to do is, for example, make sure that the two particles are neutrally charged such that they don't interact through electrostatics. And it makes, means you have to make sure that the particles are sufficiently far away such that the casimir pedalta force, for example, is uh, negligible between them. So, okay, so with this then, we can then conclude that if we run this experiment and we see entanglement, that uh, gravity must be non-classical. And as such, we refer to it as it must be at some level quantum. But what does this really tell us about gravity? Like, 
do do we have a way of explaining this? Does this mean that obviously uh, string theory or something, you know, the more uh, out there theories are correct, which, well, we'd say, no, all it tells us is that it must be non-classical. But we already have a description of a perfectly valid quantum description of what, be, what could be going on here. So specifically uh, in the language of gravity, we want to, you know, specifically general relativity, we want to be talking about space-time metric as the actual source for gravitational effects. So does this mean that we have the entire space-time metric in a superposition? Uh, well, many people will tell you that that's uh, difficult to really comment on as it, it's hard to say what it means for the entirety of space-time to be in a superposition. But as we've got relatively small particles and we're moving at non-relativistic non speeds, uh, we, are, we can consider ourselves in the uh, linearized gravity regime, whereby you write down the space-time metric as just some background, which uh, for the case of the experiment would just be a Minkowski background, flat space-time background, plus some sort of perturbation. So this would be the perturbation caused by the existence of the masses, they're moving, that sort of thing. So with this, and just in the standard uh, tools that general relativity gives us, we can write down the Einstein-Hilbert action. And this sort of characterizes the, uh, the metric itself. Uh, when we have a, uh, an action, we can sort of, uh, in a hand wavy way, I'll say do quantum field theory to it, which allows us to write down an associated propagator, which tells us how the, uh, the, any sort of particle would associated with the field would uh, move. And so in the case of linearized gravity, this is known as the graviton propagator. And so it effectively tells us that uh, such a field uh, admits gravitons. Now, if we were to say, okay, we've got this, but what does this actually mean? What does this look like? And we say, let's take this graviton propagator and see what it tells us how uh, two masses interact with one another. All it concludes is that uh, all you, you find is that Newtonian gravitational potential, it sort of just naturally pops out, that that is the interaction energy between two masses. So what this tells us is that if we have two masses in, at least in the, the limit of linearized gravity, when you've got a, a background plus some extra uh, perturbation, that um, you are completely capable of describing such a situation uh, as an entirely quantum uh, uh, behavior. Obviously, just the existence of this description doesn't tell it doesn't let us conclude that gravity is quantum. But given we've got a uh, experiment which tells us that, which would tell us whether gravity is quantum or not, and it relies only on the Newtonian gravitational potential, one is free to in at least interpret this as a strong evidence towards uh, the existence of, for example, gravitons. And so what we're seeing then is effectively superposition of space-time of metric perturbations against some sort of background. So uh, in conclusion, we have a, a fairly clear experiment with the uh, potential ability to prove that gravity is fundamentally a quantum theory. Uh, secondly, we have a, a a positive result would hold regardless of the underlying physical theory. So it doesn't rely on, for example, the existence of gravitons or any sort of more, uh, shall we say, uh, experiment or hypothetical um, physical theories. Um, but we also still have, at least in the situations of weak gravity, the ability to, do, to, ascribe, to describe gravity as a quantum in nature without going beyond classical, uh, you know, sorry, standard uh, general relativity and standard uh, quantum field theory. Um, and just as a somewhat of as uh, an aside, we can say that the, um, the, as the entanglement that forms is dependent on the form of the gravitational potential, this experiment could uh, actually provide a method of um, testing uh, for non-Newtonian forces, so or more accurately, non-Newtonian non modifications to the Newtonian potential, at least at the short range, which is uh, currently not a very well probed region. So for more sort of the actual details, this is the uh, uh, paper which we uh, 
wrote on the subject. So feel free to look up that for more details. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for this uh, nice uh, talk. So I see we have already some uh, hands raised. Just a reminder of the questions are just three minutes. So just for short questions and then longer questions can be at the, the end when all three speakers uh, have finished their talk. So I see the first, there's a hand by uh, Huri. Can you, can you unmute and ask the question? Yeah, hello, do you hear me? Hi, yes. Uh, yes, I just wanted, because you mentioned graviton, but in some quantum gravity models, um, graviton is in fact a, a, a sort of effective, uh, let's say, uh, classical field. And uh, the, the underneath uh, particle can be like other interactions, a, a vector. Uh, can... Observation, for instance, interpretation of the uh, of the experiment be somehow mislead if uh, there is such a such a case. Um, so the, the 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 concrete conclusion from the experiment uh, really just goes back to um, uh, it's explicitly finds that the gravitational uh, interaction is non classical. That's concretely all the experiment will tell us. So. The uh, fact that we can ascribe potentially a graviton to it is only just a, a, an interpretation. So definitely, if you sort of interpret it that way, you could do it in wrong. But the, 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 the fundamental point of the experiment would show that it's non-classical. And there's, there's, as provided those assumptions hold, we believe there's no way to interpret it as there's some sort of fundamental classicality behind it all. So obviously, if you choose to interpret it in such a way as the that you try to describe it as a as gravitons, but then perhaps that that might just be completely wrong. But the experiment doesn't rely on any for any explicit form for gravity. It, it as long as on some level uh, gravity acts, uh, you know, we can write down a, a wave function of this sort of form, even if it was a slightly different uh, uh, interaction strength or energy. Um, it should be. The conclusion that gravity must be at some level quantum still holds. Okay, thank you. If that makes sense. Okay, so um, let me ask you. So, just a very short question. So, I will ask these all three speakers. So, what do you do? You think is the next thing, the most pressing thing, I, theory wise, to do in terms of understanding this experiment and implementing it? Well. Uh, well, uh, I'll, the, the most pressing thing is somewhat of a cheat based on your question, but I would say to do the experiment. You know, this, this all means nothing if you do the experiment and you don't see any entanglement, because obviously that would, you could take that as some small evidence to being gravity is classical, but ultimately there could be a million and one things that went wrong in an experiment. So it, it's, it's, it's a more of a non-answer. So I would say doing the experiment. But so if you wanted a, a theoretical but uh, next step, it's really we we need to work on building such an apparatus. So this really requires larger superpositions in terms of both the mass and the size than we've currently ever done. But we're working on the the method of doing this. So their proposal was to use uh, stern gerlach interferometry, as but up until uh, about five years ago, ten years ago, that was believed to be broadly likely impossible just due to the what's known as the Humpty Dumpty effect where it's, it's very very difficult to get any sort of coherent information at the out in the output but uh, there's um, Ron Folman's group has successfully done it with atoms and so it's just a matter of scaling it up really so how exactly to scale it up is, is the, the theoretical question if that's yeah okay thank you very very good answer uh, so uh, can I ask a question please um, Okay, if it's a very quick question, yes. Go or ahead. I can go after you. If, if, oh, if you have yeah, then I can ask. Can one more minute. Um, Sorry? We have one more minute, you can ask. Okay, so it's a, it's a very kind of probably naive question. Now, Ryan, when you say like something like gravitons, so is it similar conception like photons then? Or... Uh, yes. Okay. So at least as, uh, you know, 
the uh, interpreting in Indra's in direct uh, take a Hilbert Einstein Hilbert action uh, find the propagator. Uh, it, it, yeah. It's a directly equivalent, and so, so it, it's sort of nothing new. Actually, now like in photons, you know, like in the field, the electrical field, or so on, if you consider. Then that Sorry, can, can you say that again? Photons communicating from one side to the other, right? Sorry, can you say that again? It just cut out a little okay. bit. Okay, so the, my question, actual question is then like, if photon is, uh, sorry, graviton is something like photon, like a photon. Now, how many gravitons will be emitted when they communicate? So one particle communicate with the other. Uh, so for the, like so to produce a measurable effect, many, 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 many. So what we want, what we're not looking to see is like discrete, uh, uh, levels of gravitons there would be so many that you, you would only really so, i, I so believe sort of energy involved sorry is there any kind of formulation so if this is the mass then that many gravitons should be emitted uh yeah. i believe so but i i i nothing i don't i can't think of what it is i, I believe i've seen something similar to that but uh, i might have to refer you to other people or <laughs> sorry maybe we can come back to this question at the sure. end just for um so let, let's then move to the next uh, uh, speaker. Uh, so um, the next speaker is uh, Sandro Donadi. So he's currently at, uh, working at uh, the Frankfurt Institute of Advanced Studies. Before that, he was a research fellow at the University of Ulm and at University of Trieste. So Sandro has uh, done a series of work in various different, addressing various different problems in the foundations of uh, quantum mechanics. So let me just, um, so for example, just to tell you how versatile his works are. So he worked on spontaneous wave function collapse models, on Bohmian mechanics, but also on super determinism. Uh, today, he will talk about um, uh, a particular uh, wave functions con uh, collapse models, which is motivated by gravity. Um, and um, so with this, I give the floor um, to Sandro. Uh, so, yeah, hello. Go ahead. Thank you, Marco. Sorry, probably I shared the screen too early. No, anyway. <laughs> No, so thank you to, to Marco, to Sofia, first of all, and to all the organizers for uh, inviting uh, me and to have the opportunity for, for giving this talk about uh, our work and also for listening about the other works. I think it's a very nice idea to, to have done these uh, seminars. Um, so given the little time, I start immediately. Uh, so I'm going to discuss a, an experiment uh, what, uh, what we tested the Joseph Penrose model by studying the radiation emission of uh, from a germanium atom at the underground uh, Grand Sasso laboratories. Uh, this is the, the reference paper for the work, and these are the other authors, but I will tell more at the end. So um, let me start with uh, very, very quick introduction to the motivation because the Ozzy Penrose model was introduced uh, as a possibility for solving the measurement problem. Measurement problem which consists in this, that in standard quantum theory, we have these uh, two different dynamics for the state vector, the Schrodinger equation, which is the linear and deterministic, and the collapse, which is non-linear and stochastic. However, quantum mechanics is ambiguous in telling when one is supposed to use one or another uh, dynamics. And this is a point on which uh, many people stress and in particular John Bell, I think uh, summarized the problem in this quote in a very lucid and clean way. And the problem is exactly which system uh, are qualified to be considered as measurement devices. So one has to use uh, the collapse. So there are no clear answers for this in uh, quantum mechanics, and this is substantially the measurement problem. A, a possible program of research way out for this uh, measurement problem is to actually try to, to merge these two dynamics in a single dynamics, which also include the collapse of a wave function as a dynamical process. And this is the line of research of collapse models. 
And in this framework, uh, as Marco already said, uh, the OZPANROS model has also the, the nice feature to relate with spontaneous collapse to gravity. Now, uh, let me introduce the, the PANROS proposal. Uh, so uh, the original proposal comes back to 1996. Uh, and the idea is the following. Uh, imagine that you have a mass in a spatial superposition, like I try to make the picture here, here plus there. And then uh, this superposition of the mass in two location will also induce a superposition of this different uh, of space times curved in different ways. And then panels put forward uh, two main arguments for which uh, this uh, superposition of different space time should not be allowed and therefore should not be stable, especially when the mass is large and so the difference between the two space time generated by the different configuration is uh, larger. Um, the, in particular, I, for who is interested, I strongly suggest to read the motivation put forward in the more recent paper, uh, which uh, basically uh, discuss possible conflict between the equivalence principle and the superposition principle. Now, this is the idea. Uh, more quantitatively, uh, panels before gives a way to measure the difference between these two space time. And uh, this is done by in terms of an energy which can be computed at this uh, Newtonian limit, so no relativistic and limit uh, by substantially considering the self-Newtonian interaction of the difference between the two mass density with mu A is the mass density when the particle is in the state A and mu B when the particle is located uh, around the point B. And then given this energy uncertainty, uh, in analogy of what is done also, for example, with nuclear decay, one can associate to this a time of collapse, uh, which is substantially h bar divided by this quantity. And at this stage, uh, it's nice to, to try to put some number to get a feeling of what, what is the magnitude of this effect. And so if you take, for example, a proton, uh, then it turns out that this time of collapse for this superposition, as predicted by this formula, is of order of millions of years, which explains why we do not observe a proton to spontaneously collapse. But on the other hand, if you take, for example, a dust grain of with a radius of order of 10 micrometers, so and it's not even something so macroscopic, it's relatively small, then the time of collapse is of order of 10 to the power minus 8 seconds. So uh, even if one is able to put it in a superposition, according to this uh, prescription, it will collapse in basically an instant. So this is the, the idea suggested by Panados. Uh, now let me introduce the, the Diosi model, uh, which was uh, introduced actually even before. And uh, in this model, there is a, a precise dynamics for the state vector, which is given by this uh, equation. Uh, for who is familiar with the um, collapse model, this is the typical structure of all this collapse equation. And the important part, and now there is no time to go in detail, but there is substantially the first term, which is the usual Schrodinger term. And then the second one, which describes the collapse. And this collapse, one can prove that uh, is, of course, a collapse in space. So you suppress uh, spatial superposition. It becomes larger, the larger is the mass of the system involved. And also, it, the equation is built in such a way to not allow for possibly faster than light signaling and other issues that can happen when you introduce nonlinearities in. Um, in the equation for the state vector. So uh, this is a consistent, uh, well-defined equation. W what is the connection with Penrose proposal? Well, if you compute the master equation associated to this model, then you won't find out this uh, Lindblad master equation. The fact that this Lindblad is a consequence that this W is a binary process, so the dynamic here is Markovian. And then if you study the behavior of the off-diagonal element in the position basis and you neglect the 
the standard evolution, so you only look for the effect of a collapse, it turned out that they decay exponentially with a time of decay, which is so basically the same modulo, some factor for pi of the one suggested by Penrose. This is the reason why the two models have been uh, associated. I want also to add that uh, as long as you just take this time of decay and you uh, assume that the collapse is Poissonian in time, basically the, the simplest dynamics that you can come with uh, will lead to this master equation. Now, given this uh, model, how one can test it? Well, uh, the obvious thing, the most natural and also the more direct is, is to do a, a test where you are able to create a spatial superposition of something enough massive and to keep this spatial superposition stable for times longer than this time of uh, decay or time of collapse predicted by the model. And then you can check whether the superposition has really collapsed and then confirm the model, or if it is not collapsed, then you can disprove it. Now, um, some suggestions on how to do this have been put forward by Penrose and collaborator himself using optomechanical device. This is an old paper, but that was quite relevant in starting probably helping to start optomechanics itself. More recently, there is a proposal using Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, in general, of course, this list is not exhaustive because you can think about any proposal which is trying to create a superposition of larger and larger masses can fall in this uh, category. And this is a question which is interesting uh, beyond Joseph Panos or collapse model in general is something that uh, we have time to achieve anyway. I'm also mentioning yet experiment in space uh, since I think they are a promising way because not having gravity allow you to, to study free system for a long time um, without having to trap them and so without uh, avoiding all the problems related to noises, decoherence, and so on. However, uh, yet nowadays a direct test of Joseph Penrose model is still too hard to, to be done. And so uh, the other possibility, which is the one we explore in this work, is to do an indirect test. The idea of the indirect test is exactly to make use of the fact that when you have the dynamic given by the master equation I showed before, uh, then the collapse not only does decoherence, which is uh, basically a consequence of uh, having collapse in space, but it also implies some increase, for example, of the uh, average energy of the system or in general uh, of the position variance. So intuitively one can really imagine that it is as if there is a noise, a Brovian-like motion associated to the system, which is jiggling. And then uh, one, and this effect is that this is an important part, even if the system is not put in a superposition. So for doing this in direct test, you don't need to create a, a, a superposition in space, still you can look for signature in direct of this collapse. And uh, this is what we did studying the radiation emission, the radiation, how it is connected with this Brownian motion by the same logic, but uh, also in classical physics, when you have an accelerated particle, which is if the particle is electrically charged, it will emit radiation. It is the same principle here. And so, um, and it is also, I have to say, an idea that was already used for uh, the other collapse model like the CSL and was quite effective. Uh, so we, it was kind of natural to try to apply it also to, to the Joseph Penrose model. So the idea is to compute this predicted radiation emission and then compare it to what is observed in the experiment. Now about the theoretical calculation, um, I mean, is, there is no time to go in detail. If anyone one is curious, is reading maybe and he has one question, feel free to also write to me or ask later. Well, the central quantity that uh, we computed was the uh, radiation emission rate, which means the number of photons emitted um, at a given energy. 
per second. And to compute that, the, the central quantity to compute is this uh, number of photos emitted at time t. And the calculation was done using the, this is the same master equation as before, it's just written in a different form. And the Hamiltonian here include the system, which in our case was the Germanium crystal, uh, the free uh, electromagnetic uh, field, uh, which here is treated using second quantization. So, and then the interaction between uh, matter and uh, electromagnetic field. Now, the calculation, of course, can be carried on only perturbatively uh, in an analytical way. And this is what we did treating this uh, in electromagnetic interaction and the collapse part as a perturbation. And at the end, uh, we arrive to this final formula. Uh, so let me just comment uh, this one. Uh, so the first thing is that important to say is that this formula for the emission rate is not valid for any photon emitted with any wavelength, but is only valid in this regime. In particular, it's important that the wavelength is smaller than the atomic size, because uh, if you consider emission of photons with a larger wavelength than the size of an atom, then the emission from the electron and the one from the protons in the nuclei uh, cancel out. And so you have a strong suppression and you don't get this result. So um, here we have different factors. The effect, of course, grows with a number of atoms of, uh, in the crystal, but it also grows as n squared, where this n is the atomic number, so the number of protons in each nuclei. And uh, this squaring factor is a new feature in this kind of theoretical calculation, and it is um, a consequence of the fact that the all protons in the same nuclei emit coherently, and because the emission goes as the square of the charge, you get this n square factor, which in case of germanium n is 32, so it is not a detail. I mean, it brings you a factor 30 of improvement in the theoretical prediction. And then in the denominator, we have the, the energy, the, the frequency, okay, of the photon. Also, of course, photons with larger energy are less likely to be emitted. And we have this R0, which uh, actually is an important quantity because it's the one on which we set the bound, which is the mass, the size of the mass density. So uh, in the formula I showed before for the time of collapse, if you take that formula and you replace the mass density with a point like uh, mass density, then uh, even for an electron, for a neutron, for any kind of mass, no matter how much is small, the time of collapse will be zero, which means for point-like particle, you should never observe any quantum effect. So this, of course, it cannot be, is clearly incompatible with experiments. And so uh, one needs to introduce some parameter which uh, uh, allow to, to describe this spread in space of the mass density. And, this is exactly the role of this at zero. Now, two words about the experiment. Um, so it was done at uh, Grand Sasso Laboratories, which are uh, under Grand Sasso. The, the reason for this location is that the effect is very tiny, so we want uh, to have as much as possible a low noise environment. The setup is uh, I mean, it's very schematic uh, way is this one. So these green things is the germanium crystal, which have a size of eight centimeters, so it's microscopic. And all around there are different shields of uh, copper, lead, which are further isolated together with a mountain on top. And on this graph on the right, there are the, the data measured. Um, I just want to, so uh, here you, you can see two Instagram. The gray one are the data measured and the green line are the Monte Carlo simulated. Uh, so because there, there were some known effects that also induce photon in this energy range. And of course we wanted to subtract them from the data. 
but I just want to draw the attention on the fact that even without subtracting any background, uh, still the total number of photon observed in two months of data is only 576. So it's really a very, very low uh, rate. And this very low rate allowed uh, to, to set a very strong bound on, on this uh, R0 that I introduced before, this parameter, which uh, according to, by doing the comparison between this data and the theoretical formula, turned out to, that it must be larger than 0.5 Armstrong. Now, this is a good result by itself compared to previous bound, which were very in the literature, is almost three times, uh, three order of magnitudes stronger, which is this green line. But also it's interesting because um, in his uh, proposal, Pandros tried to give a, a way to compute this at zero directly from the wave function of the system. So to not have it as a free parameter. And uh, if you do the calculation using this prescription for the germanium atom in the crystal, it turned out that uh, the R zero predicted should be 10 times smaller than the one set by the bound. So at least this version of a model with this prescription for the mass density and also with this Poissonian decay in time, the, the other assumption uh, is uh, currently ruled out. So uh, what are the future perspective, the conclusion? So uh, first of all, I want to say that, I mean, there are good reason, in my opinion, for, uh, which describe this tension between general relativity and superposition principle. Uh, they have been put forward by Diozzi, Penrose. So, and so what we eliminated is only the simplest model. So I think this should not be the end of this kind of idea. They just need to get updated. How one can do that? These are just some suggestions, but uh, the list can be longer. So. One way can be to just leave at zero as a free parameter. You, at that point, can take uh, more or less any value you want. Of course, this is not really satisfactory from a theoretical point of view. You would like something which is still some meaning or related to gravity. So this is, is the simpler solution, but maybe not the best. Another possibility can be to introduce more complex dynamics. So for example, having something non-Markovian or uh, some dissipative effect, which then can mitigate this uh, heating, this uh, Brownian-like motion. And so also the radiation will be affected by this. Or uh, another option can be to really introduce some new richer framework and to really try to completely avoid this heating effect that, uh, and this is something on which Penrose is uh, working and he always told us, and also I think if you're taking a decent seminar, he really don't like that there is this eating. So he's really looking forward for avoiding this. And yeah, again, about the future perspective, the same analysis can be also done now for CSL model, but it was done even before, but now there are new data, new theoretical, formula with that n square factor. So we plan to apply to also this. So these are the co-authors. I'm about to finish now. So um, Christian, Catalina, and Matthias are on the experimental side. While well, of course, Laios Dioz and Angelo Bassi, together with me, took care more of the, um, we took care more of the theoretical part. And I thanks also the professor and Franklin Fund for currently paying my scholarship at FIAS. And I thank you for that. Listen. Thank you for this interesting talk, Sandro. So we have time for a quick question. So, so there are no questions. So you, so you have addressed already the question which I had in mind. So let me ask a slightly different one. Okay. Uh, do you, have, um, do you have any ideas for using an interferometric uh, scheme uh, to, to, to study? So you have address here from the non-interferometric, but do you have an idea for an inter interferometric scheme to, to address uh, Penrose's idea? Mm, I have some idea. I, I think, as I mentioned at a certain point, a, a promising direction can be really to go to space, probably because where it seems 
but, but according to some calculations and we are doing, but it would be possible to have this uh, superposition of uh, relatively large masses, even 10 to the power nine atomic mass for uh, several seconds. I, I actually didn't check if this would be enough to, to test uh, the Jersey panels, but I would say this is probably one of the best way to go. There is also this proposal of Romero Isard with, uh, but on that I am not really familiar. I didn't study it uh, uh, in detail. So I have in mind this too, but I'm, if anyone has a suggestion, I'm uh, very happy to listen. Okay, well, thank you again. Uh, so let's move to the final speaker. So the final uh, speaker is um, Matteo Carlesso from the University of Trieste, where he's a research fellow. Uh, he, he has done a series of work on investigating um, uh, quantum foundations, in particular studying uh, and looking for experimental evidence um, to test uh, spontaneous wave function collapse models. He's also an active member of the tech project. Um, and in addition, he is also interested in low, ener low energy quantum gravity. And with this, I now give uh, the floor to uh, Matteo. So, Matteo, if you can uh, share your screen. Th th thank you very much, Marco. Uh, do, do you hear me? Uh, and and I, I think you you see my screen. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, really shortly, uh, I, I, I have uh, this quarter of hour, so I will uh, say run over a few um, few things I would like to to, to talk about. So uh, the title of this talk is uh, is witnessing the quantum nature of linearized gravity, and I would like to bring out a few of the challenges that tabletop experiments must face. So, and, uh, and which could be also uh, uh, a point uh, to, to, to talk or to, to, to look at, uh, to develop new, uh, new proposals, new ideas uh, in, in testing uh, this quantumness of, 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 uh, of gravity. Okay, so I would like to start uh, uh, with one consideration, uh, as we already saw from, from this uh, block of seminars, uh, there is really a lot of different literature tackling the problem of uh, uh, what, which characteristic, which features, which quantum features one should uh, look at uh, uh, in this testing of, of, of uh, gravity. Okay, uh, I would like to um, focus mainly on two blocks of experiments. Uh, this is the first block, uh, which uh, Mauro uh, in, the first, uh, in the first week but also Ryan uh, talked about. And this is uh, the idea is uh, these experiments are, are based on the idea that a quantum mediator can uh, of gravity can entangle masses. Uh, the second uh, block of experiments, instead, uh, it directly uh, wants to test uh, the superposition of a gravitational field generated by, by itself by a superposition. Uh, by masses in, in a superposition state. Okay, so uh, starting from the first, first block, uh, the general idea is based on uh, this uh, local, uh, local operation and classical communication uh, protocol, say. And the idea is that uh, this kind of operation, so local operations uh, or uh, a classical mediator of interaction cannot generate entanglement. So briefly, if I have two systems, two masses in this particular case, and I want to see uh, which is the interaction between them, and I know that there is a third system, an ancilla, uh, which uh, um, connects the two, the two systems. Um, so if this ancilla uh, is classical, then it cannot generate entanglement. So, if there is some entanglement that is actually measured, then this means that the, um, the ancilla, or if you want the interaction between them, is a quant uh, ha has some quantum features. So this is the, basically the idea uh, behind these two, uh, these two big proposals. 
So in in the first uh, in this first block, uh, we have two two works, uh, one by, uh, done by uh, both and co-authors, uh, one done uh, in in the group of uh, of Latko Petrol. Uh, which came out uh, actually uh, the same day on, on, on archive and the same day also on, on PRL. And the idea is to test uh, this, this hypothesis uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, interferometric experiments. But Ryan already uh, went, uh, uh, covered this, this, this part. Uh, so I really briefly uh, just got into a in few de details. So these are the parameters which were uh, considered by uh, by Bose and uh, Marletto. And uh, this is the form of the entanglement measure uh, that they obtained uh, to this scheme. On the other side, uh, we have this uh, uh, another proposal, uh, which is, uh, is by Kresnand and collaborators. And the idea here is to have two masses, which has, are not placed in a superposition, but uh, they still can entangle between, uh, so they still can generate entanglement through uh, quantum gravity. Again, we have uh, here, uh, just for reference, uh, the, the values of the parameters they, they considered. And while they are free falling, we let them free falling, uh, they can generate uh, some entanglement and this is the form, uh, the form of it. Okay. So this is the context of these uh, uh, two different proposals. So what we did in this context uh, was to uh, compute which are the decoherence effects uh, on, on this test. So in particular for the first block, uh, we modified uh, the evolution, the Schrodinger evolution of, of the system by introducing also the decoherence effects. In particular, we consider the collisions with the residual gas. Uh, in, in the experiment, as well as the scattering absorption and emission of black body radiation. And there is a, a, a full bench of, of new parameters that one have to uh, take in account uh, when modeling the, the experiment. What we saw is that uh, uh, the form of the entanglement must also consider this action, this decoherence action uh, in, in its evolution. And uh, in particular, we, we can see here uh, that uh, for different values of this gamma parameter, uh, one, the, so the minimum value for, for this uh, uh, lambda two, which is the, uh, mm, the figure of merit for, for the entanglement to, to exist, uh, uh, so, and, and to entanglement to, to, to be generated, one should be uh, behind, uh, below this, this black line here. Um, so just to give an idea of, what happens? This is the entanglement with respect to its evolution in time. And the blue curve here shows which is the case with uh, uh, no decoherence. Well, we uh, switch on this decoherence effect and we see uh, that, that the uh, that, uh, um, entanglement is, uh, is, um, is killed, is suppressed by this decoherence uh, effect. So to be uh, a little bit more um, quantitative on, on this, we consider the few minimal environmental conditions sufficient to generate entanglement. And in particular, for a pressure uh, which is low as uh, 10 to minus 15 pascals, we saw that there is no generation of entanglement at all. So this already poses a, a, a big problem from, from the experimental side, because we should lower uh, the, the pressure of, by one order of magnitude to see some, some entanglement uh, generation. But again, we also have another problem, uh, which is that of the uh, time involved. Uh, in particular, for, for having an entanglement of uh, 0 0.1, we should let the system uh, free fall for uh, one, one second and a half, and this corresponds to 11 meters of uh, uh, free fall height. So clearly, this is not really a tabletop experiment. So one should should consider something uh, a little bit more complex. Okay, so uh, the second proposal, the, the one by Krisnanda and collaborators, uh, also here we tackle the problem by modifying the evolution. Uh, in particular, we consider the Langevin equations uh, and we add a, a dissipative as well as a noisy uh, term in the, in the dynamics. 
And again, we have some modification of uh, uh, the entanglement with respect to the uh, free case. Uh, so again, just to give a feeling of uh, what is uh, happening, uh, we have now this parameter lambda, which is uh, related to the to the gamma parameter bef uh, of before. And, and we see that in time, also this entanglement uh, cons um, constrictions are, 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 uh, can be quite strong. In fact, in, in just uh, a factor two of, uh, of uh, so a lambda that takes uh, a value of 10 to 20, which is uh, this value here, or uh, we just grow it by a factor two, uh, the value of, of, of entanglement just are lowering bar but almost a, a order of magnitude. So this is a really strong effect that the Koreans can have on, on, the, on the system. Again, to give an idea of, uh, of the experimental conditions one, one should have, we can have a generation of entanglement for 10 to minus 15 pascals by lowering also the temperature to, to uh, 10 to minus two kelvins. And so we see something, again, the, the free falling height is, is considerable, is not something uh, that can be done in a, in a standard uh, uh, tabletop experiment. Um, but again, if we want to, uh, to, to consider some more uh, less strict uh, conditions of, of for, for the environment, we, we don't have any generation uh, of, of the environment in, in this setup as well. Okay, so this was the, the first uh, the first block, um, and I would like to 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 to, see, to, to underline that uh, uh, yes that you can you can find this analysis in, in this uh, uh, archive paper uh, we we did with uh, with Simone Vladko and Chiara uh, later uh, last year. Okay, the second block is the one uh, testing the gravitational field of a superposition. So. Which is the idea? The idea is that if I have a mass in a superposition, then whether gravity is quantum or is classical, I have two different possibilities. So in this first quantum scenario, the idea is that each part of the superposition will generate its own gravitational field, so gravitational potential. And so we have a gravitational potential related, related to the part uh, alpha of the superposition and one related to the part beta. Instead, in a, a semi-classical scenario, uh, the gravitational uh, potential is generated by the full mass density. So this is related to the full wave function of the system. And so this is some, in some ways spread over the, the full superposition. OK, so the first. Uh, proposal uh, in 2015 uh, that wanted to, to address uh, the, this kind of idea uh, was to, the idea here was to add a quantum probe and so to see what happens. So in the quantum scenario, this quantum probe will be uh, pulled toward one of the, of, of the parts of the superposition, in particular the one generating uh, the, the, um, uh, the potential. So. This means that the quantum probe goes in an entangled state with the system. And, and so we have uh, uh, that this is pulled from on, on the right, plus in a superposition of being pulled on, on the left, plus being pulled on, on the right. Uh, well, in the semi classical scenario, we have just a single uh, gravitational potential. And so the, this quantum probe is pulled just towards the center of the superposition. So to test this, uh, this idea, uh, one, when one goes to, to an optomechanical uh, setup, for example, and by, by, by doing a, a standard optomechanical uh, measurement of, of, of the motion uh, along this uh, horizontal axis, one looks if the spread of the density noise spectrum uh, is uh, enlarged, and this will be uh, that uh, gravity has this, uh, so we are in this uh, quantum scenario for gravity. Well, uh, uh, if it is not, uh, we have the semi-classical scenario, uh, um, which is the one uh, we are measuring. Okay, uh, then uh, after some time, we went to a different idea. And this is a different idea was to 
test the motion of the system along two different uh, uh, directions. So not just uh, along the horizontal one, but also on, uh, along the vertical one. And this is because uh, in the quantum case, uh, uh, there is some coupling between the motion in, along the horizontal and the vertical direction of motion. And so this would mean that in also in the density in the spectrum along the, uh, the, um, the X axis, we have, so the, uh, the horizontal axis, we have uh, an insight of, uh, of the motion along the vertical axis. And this is because the density in the spectrum has a, a term which appears only in the quantum scenario. So in the classical term, we don't have this, uh, uh, this, term, this part here in the, in the orange bo uh, box. Okay, so the framework is, is the following one. We have two different uh, scenarios. One is the quantum one, which is tested uh, by, these two, um, the, by these two proposals. And one is the semi-classical one. And I ha we have um, another idea in, in, in to test this, 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 uh, this scenario. So with respect to all the other proposals, I think this is the almost the only one or among the, the uh, a small number of proposals that uh, wants to test the semi-classical scenario in place of testing some quantum net, directly testing the quantumness of, of, of gravity. So in this sense can be uh, um, a counter uh, a counter test for 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 testing the the quantumness. Okay, so the idea here is to use a, a single self testing system. So also here uh, is something which is quite different from from the other proposals. So. Um, what we did was to consider this uh, a sort of nano rod, so two spheres uh, uh, put together with a rod. And uh, we embedded uh, one of the two spheres with a spin. We create a superposition of the spin. Uh, and through this, uh, we can uh, uh, translate the superposition from the uh, spin degrees of freedom to the uh, rotational degrees of freedom. And so what we have is a uh, our nanorod, which is in a superposition of, uh, of angles. Okay, and now we, we consider the two, the two scenarios. The first one is uh, the quantum scenario. Each part of the superposition uh, generates his own gravitational field. So, but this gravitational field, so this gravitational potential acts also on uh, uh, the, on the part of the superposition that uh, generates it. So this means that the, that the red gravitational potential will act only on, on this part of the nanorod, while the blue one will act only on this part of the nanorod. And this is uh, exactly what happens also for uh, the, uh, the electric case, for example. Uh, the, 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 the electro electromagnetic Interaction is, is quantum, so also also that one will will uh, will act on the system in, in in this particular shape. So this means that because every part of the superposition feels only uh, the potential that uh, it is generated by by by, by itself, uh, nothing will actually happen, and this is the big difference uh, with respect to the other proposals. So what happens instead in the semi-classical uh, scenario? In the semi-classical scenario, uh, the two parts of the superposition generate a single uh, potential, gravitational potential, but the action of this gravitational potential uh, is on both the parts of the superposition. So at the end, this means that uh, uh, the two parts of the superposition will fill each other. And so one would have that the angle between these two, uh, these parts of these parts of the superposition of the nanorod will fill each other. And so the angle will shrink. And this is what we would like to test with this proposal. And so we actually um, saw that uh, this is something that can be, uh, can, this is a, is a problem which can be experimentally tackled. And so we are uh, also here. We are. We would like uh, to 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 push this idea through uh, the the experimental community and see if uh, if is something that that can be 
can be uh, performed. Okay, so just as a summary, so to test qu the quantumness of gravity is it's still something really challenging, uh, and and also the most uh, um, renovated uh, proposals must face uh, a lot of, of, of problems. Uh, in particular, we did this analysis of the coherence effects, uh, and and in in the problem of uh, uh, gravity induced entanglement. And we saw that this uh, the, the, the generation of entanglement is reduced, if, if not completely suppressed, by the coherence effects. Then uh, we went through another idea, which is the testing of uh, the superposition of gravitational field, uh, which can uh, pursue to optomechanical tests, all by this uh, single self-probing system uh, uh, idea, say. OK, and with that, uh, I would like to thank you for, for the attention. So thank you for this uh, nice talk. So we have time for uh, one or two brief questions. So, so let me may, maybe so uh, ask, ask a sim a, the same question I asked the other ones. So you have given a list of possible proposals. W which of these, so what proposal would you would, would you try to implement in the near future? So where do you want to focus? Okay, uh, from my, my, my personal perspective, I would focus more on, on the last one. So the one of the self-probing system. And uh, uh, this because uh, obviously it faces a lot of problems as the queers, which are common problems for, for all the systems, for all the proposals. Uh, but uh, conversely to, to other proposals, uh, there are some other uh, problems that uh, they are not raised here. So in particular, uh, Ryan today uh, was talking about a few conditions to actually implement, uh, for example, the, uh, this uh, uh, gravity-induced entanglement scheme. Uh, among those, uh, uh, there is a full list of, of problems uh, uh, um, and, and articles that tackles, tackle these problems. For example, there is the interaction, the uh, electromagnetic interaction between uh, the two systems uh, in, in the interferometer. Since this is a, instead is a self-probing system, and uh, as we saw here in the quantum case, so uh, quantum interaction will act only on a single part of the superposition, one does not have this kind of extra disturbances uh, that goes to, to, to it. No? And so uh, looking at uh, uh, classical uh, features of gravity, it is maybe it's more easy to, to, to develop and, and, and to pursue. So this would be, um, I would like to, to push in this direction, actually. Okay, thank you. So, since there are no other uh, questions, uh, with this I want to thank again all the all the speakers and very interesting talks. And I also want to thank again the organizers. And uh, the formal part of this um, session is not over, but of course, as Sophia mentioned at the beginning, there is time for informal discussions and additional questions to the speakers. Uh, so, with this, I now give. Uh, the floor back to, to the organizers. Thank you so much, um, Marco, and thank you, uh, Ryan, Sandra, and um, Matteo, for those three fantastic talks. As Marco said, if there are any more questions, um, then we're really happy to take them. Um, I guess I have a quick one for um, Matteo. Uh, so I was wondering if there are any, um, or, and I think Anis had some questions as well, um, Anis, do you want to come back to that first? Uh, hello, Sophia, Hi. thank you. Ryan, again, like, no, I mean, do, do you have, like, I, I was just trying to understand, like, how gravitons, like, uh, interact. Like, if you have multiple gravitons, then is there any problem in, in terms of coherence or decoherence, whatever way you see it? Like, say, if, if gravitons kind of emit it, do they, are they emitted continuously? Or if, if that is continuously, then how the coherence or the entanglement kind of evolve? Like, is there any problem there? Or, 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 or 
I mean, how, how do you see it? Maybe Ryan would like to yeah, sure. take this one. Yeah. So I'd uh, like that. That definitely is a, a concern of sorts that uh, ult ultimately in terms of the uh, continuous admission that would have to happen, because ultimately, if if this sort of interpretation is correct, then any sort of gravitational no idea, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like I would do any sort of gravitational interaction would amount to um, uh, the exchange of offshore gravitons, and so yeah. what you would what would mean it, it would be basically a direct um, uh, to understand that would be basically a standard decoherence analysis with looking at the yeah. superposition interacting with just the external environment, and yeah. given that um, you know you can't screen gravity that would just always be present there. Exactly. So that, yeah, so that, that, that would entirely be it. But it, it wouldn't be, at least as far as that model goes, it doesn't take you beyond what would, you know, you would conclude mm -hmm. in terms of the decoherence level from, yeah. you know, just a standard analysis of that sort of, of that form. Yeah, but as well, like, you know, like if you, if you imagine, like the photons, photon has a certain frequency, right? Now, does Gaviton has that as well? And then, like how do we kind of differentiate from a graviton from a particle like the superposed particles and graviton from other kind of say object that has, has gravity. So is there any kind of differentiation between that? Uh, so I, I don't really think so. So it's, as far as the model goes, it, it's largely uh, very similar in, in many respects. So any sort of, the, the sort of uh, interactions that we'd see for, you know that fits in certainly inside the uh, non-linear, in, in terms of linear gravity, would by default be just you know standard three-level tree diagrams where you've got uh, two uh, two arms of a, the incoming and outgoing mass, and then one arm of the graviton. But the graviton self-interaction is part of uh, the model when you extend it further. If that's yeah, but I I think yeah, it's. No, I, the I way it, sorry, sorry, you go. Is that, if that sort of answers you. your question. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, well, I mean, I, I have no not much idea like how the gravitons works, like what, what are the frequencies? I mean, are those frequencies depends on the size of the mass and so on? I have no idea. I'm just trying to understand like how those things work, basically. Maybe I can add something to, to Ryan's answer to Anissa's question. So these are, so as Ryan has been saying, these are off-shell gravitons, you see. So they are some over all the, these are virtual gravitons, right? So virtual is the more common term in, you know, in quantum optics than, than off-shell. So these are, are, are not like the gravitational wave gravitons, which are on shell. They, they obey the equations of motion, while these are uh, sum over all possible energies you know, from zero to infinity. So, so, so when, only when they are absorbed by a mass, they cause a coherent interaction, you see? So if these virtual gravitons, they were absorbed by another mass, then that would be like a decoherence, but they are not, they are not going to infinity. They are not, uh, you know. So they are, they are just sourced from the vacuum and absorbed by the other mass. You see, so these are virtual uh, gravitons, uh, but they are still gravitons. I mean, uh, but they are they are exchange particles rather than, uh, uh, rather than the, the, not like the photon you observe in a cavity, which uh -huh. is on shell. Yeah, these are a bit like. Um, so if you uh, have seen this Harosh experiment of, you know, atoms going through an empty cavity, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So there are photons which would be, you know, emitted by one, uh, one yeah. atom and absorbed by the other atom. Right, right. Yeah. So, so they, those are, it, those, yeah, would range over all. Mm -hmm. Is it similar to that or? Uh, it is yeah, yeah. It's, it's very similar to that. I mean, the closest thing which comes is like lambda transitions in, uh, you know, Atomic physics. In that case, then, like in uh, Harrow's experiment, in that case, like the actual uh, photons is like kind of uh, exchanged, right? And that's what entangles. Like, yeah, exactly. But except that the cavity is empty and remains empty, so the the, the photons are not not uh, like on shell photons. So there's no time in which you will find the the atom and the photon like the photon taking the entanglement. Okay, so at all times. You can fully eliminate, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it looks like a coherent interaction all the times just because you sum over all the possible, you know, photon states of all energies. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, like in the 
Um, uh, sorry, Anis, if I sorry to interrupt. Sorry, um, yeah. I was yeah. just going to check if um, if there are any other questions, oh, sure, um, yeah. and that's, otherwise we can we can keep yeah. Yeah, going yeah. with this discussion. That is true. Yeah. Okay, I think that's okay. Um, so just a reminder to everyone that we had the panel discussion. Uh, Hello, next maybe I, I have a question. Uh, yes, of course. For, uh, for, um, uh, from Matteo, uh, I wanted to know if uh, uh, from the first experiment, uh, they could put any constraint, for instance, uh, lower limit, for, uh, sorry, um, upper limit for the, the entanglement uh, by gravity. Do you mean uh, if there is uh, some, um, so which are the, the, the experimental uh, The first experiment, I don't know if you have, if you just uh, studied the experiment or really uh, performed the experiment. If uh, you perform the experiment, I, uh, I would like to know if uh, you could put a, a sort of a limit on the entanglement by, uh, by uh, by gravity because you didn't observe but uh, at least uh, from your uh, from your noise or something uh, uh, in, uh, were you able to put a, a limit on uh, on the entanglement? So uh, yeah, that, that you, what you have is that the the the, the coherence obviously is reducing this entanglement. The the problem is that uh, the experimental uh, values of pressure and temperature, for instance. Are not sufficient to uh, so the, the the state of art uh, uh, per, per experimental parameters are not sufficiently uh, quiet. Say so the, the environment uh, is not sufficiently quiet to actually generate the environment in the first place. So and this is the uh, for now is the state of art uh, um, situation. What will happen in, uh, in uh, I don't know, a few years, decades uh, or, or so, I, I have no idea. Um, this is the, say, one of the problems uh, what, uh, this kind of experiments must face. I, I don't know if uh, I answered to, to your question. Yeah, but uh, I realized that you really, you didn't perform the experiment itself. You, no, just, no. Uh, you just studied how it can be done. Exactly. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. No, I understand. Thanks. Okay, are there any other questions? So, 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 Sophia, depending on how informal it is, I, I have some small questions for both Matteo and, and Sandro. Sure. Yeah. Um, as long as we are happy um, to go ahead, because I'm aware that we have. Um, uh -huh. Right. Uh, we've gone um, above uh, Quite over. Yeah, yeah. after the hour. So as long as um, Matteo and Sandra are happy to continue, uh, for sure. Yeah, so um, I guess, so the question for Sandra is, is, is somewhat related to something, I, I think you, you wrote probably that elsewhere, that whenever collapse has some time, right, some finite duration of time, that there is some problem with uh, communicating uh, faster than light or something like that. Is that, is that something you wrote somewhere? Um, uh, no, well, uh, what I laughed about the possibility of faster than light communication is not about the time of collapse, is about uh, um, that is a problem that arises typically when you have nonlinear uh, right. deterministic Schrodinger equation, like in the Schrodinger Newton equation, for example, that is the problem. Mm. And that's why when you want to do a proper collapse dynamics, you have to put also some uh, stochasticity right. and it has to be put in the right way. Right. The final check at the end is always to compute the master equation. And as long as the master equation is linear, so it guarantees that uh, the uh, dif different ensemble represented by the same statistical operator evolving the same statistical operator, then things are fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not uh, strictly related to the time of collapse. Mm -hmm. Is yeah, I don't know if I answer. I see, I see. Okay, okay. No, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so you can have CSL like finite time processes as long as they are born rule stochastic. That's fine. They're faster than light signal is fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, about this. Yeah, you don't need to have the jump collapse. Even a gradual collapse. Uh, mm -hmm. I, as long as the master equation then is of 
limb blood, does not have to be limb blood, but as long as equivalent samples are sent to, are evolved in the same way, then uh, Bob cannot uh, uh, understand uh, which angle, if we think about the typical EPR situation, Bob cannot distinguish which angle it is measured and so, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter whether it's gradual or instantaneous, the collapse. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I guess for, for Matteo, I, I, I could probably just uh, read uh, that paper, but I'm just asking you uh, regarding, you know, so whenever people measure angular diffractions with, uh, you know, like a torsion balance or something, they, yeah. they have a mirror attached to, to you know, very, uh, you know, sensitively measure angles and deflections and things. So if you really have levitated things, right, um, yeah. then uh, is it possible to measure angular deflections very well or, or how do they, um, is there something described in the paper? Uh, we, we didn't tackle that, that, that part of, of, of uh, the implementation, say, of, of the experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there are uh, things about that. So there is a research in that direction. And uh, in particular, uh, Benjamin Stickler on, on the theory side uh, was a lot involved in, in that. And um, I think he, um, so uh, later last year, he, he gave this uh, uh, the lectures and I, I think he tackled the problem as well. Okay, okay. Um, but say he's the guy to, 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 ask. Yeah. to ask, yes. Uh, about uh, uh, rotations and, and how, how actually um, okay. measure that. What I can say is uh, that uh, when you deal with, uh, with angles, uh, the game is uh, that you want, to, uh, you want the rod to be really large, say, because large, large rod, so larger is, the, is, the, uh, is your object, then uh, better you can actually uh, measure the, the change in angle and, and so everything is uh, at the end of the day will be uh, is really physically related to that then there is the measurement how to actually perform the measurement and this is a, 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 another another problem but I will uh, leave it to to experimental guys because I, I have no idea how, how that uh, would actually uh, be implemented right okay anyway thank you yeah oh. mm -hmm. Thank you, Sagatu, for the for the good questions. I think it's nearing half past, um, so I, I think we will end it there. Um, but thank you so much to our speakers, and um, thank you to Mark as well for the fantastic chairing. And we look forward to see you next week. Uh, and if I could just ask um, Ryan, Sandra, and uh, Marco and um, uh, Matteo to stay on just one minute, we'd like to thank you in person, the organisers. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.